So uh, I would like to next welcome to the stage Adam Rosine. Uh, Adam is a principal of inner product uh, focused on building systems using functional programming, and he is going to be talking on the subject of no need for NIH. Uh, so let's give a round of virtual applause to, to Adam. Hello, hello. Can you hear me OK? Uh, yep. All right. Let me and see. I'm going to step off stage and let you take over. Okay. Everything look good? All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy that uh, we're doing this. It's good to see uh, faces and avatars. Uh, you, I don't have my, my usual doggy uh, avatar up. I have my actual face. Um, I gave this talk about two years ago, so it's been an interesting a uh, chance to update it and see what's changed. And quite a bit has changed and quite a bit has stayed the same. So the good parts have stayed the same and we've had improvements. So I'm happy about that. Um, so this talk, uh, it's, it's long, it's got a long title, No Need for NIH Leveraging the Stack, Typo Stack for the Enterprise. Um, so NIH is uh, not referring to the National Institute of Health but uh, not invented here. So, you know, this is sort of a, uh, a malady that we face as engineers and smart people that, uh, uh, you know, when we're building stuff for our jobs, you know, I, I can do it myself. I, you know, I, I don't like things that aren't invented here. So, but, uh, you know, we, we, in our community, we encourage open source and sharing and using things from the outside. And I think the world has definitely has changed in the last, you know, 10 years, definitely, uh, where open source is almost the norm. Um, and so I want to talk about, well, how can we leverage this thing, this, this community, this, these huge amounts of code bases and repositories and projects, um, what does it give you? What you know, it's very powerful. If you have a big lever, you can move a lot of stuff. And you know, this is about the type level stack. We have all these libraries. Um, you've heard folks mention um, cats and cats effect, and I'm I'm going to talk about the same thing. So more and more evidence uh, that things are going well. Um, and and it's going to be about. I would say that this talk is is sort of meant for folks. Who are perhaps new to type level, um, new to the Scala community. You know, they you're looking to to you're starting a project at work. You're, you're using an existing legacy system, and you see these libraries. You want to change something. You want to add something. How can you use this for your work? Um, or fun. Um, so back when I first wrote this talk, which was in 2021, which was two years ago, I think. Um, I, I, I found uh, some references to the Type Level Summit way back in 2016. And uh, Dave Gurnell, who uh, you may know from uh, like the Scholar with Cats books and other things like that, um, started talking about this thing. He, he, you know, there was discussions in the community about a Type Level stack. What would that look like? Um, and it's interesting to think about, you know, in light of some of the previous talks, like with Miles and with, with Mike Pilquist talking about the history of Scala and how type level started and changed. Um, you know, we, we need a stack. Yes, we need a stack. Um, and so a while ago, this is 2021, we, you know, we had, we, we made a, a GitHub, pro, uh, GitHub organization and there were 66 repos. Oh, but that was, now we have way more. Now we have like twi uh, twice as many. We have like over 100 repositories and, you know, twice as many official people committing and things like that. So, uh, you know, the curve is, is keeps going up uh, and we're building and building. So, so sort of con concrete evidence to some of the things people have been saying about, you know, the adoption and people becoming comfortable and building layers upon layers and, and is it working? Are, are projects dying out? Are they are they just sticking around because they're rock solid? So this is something to celebrate. Um, and actually, just this year, I think it was this year, um, we do have a stack, sort of in a very um, concrete sense. Um, there's the Scala CLI project, and uh, 
basically it's it's really great. It lets you I use it to like prototype all the time and write little scripts to kind of test out ideas and techniques. And so you can just uh, add this little snippet here, you know, to the beginning of your uh, of your files and just say use the type level stack, you know, the latest one. And then you can just import whatever you want. And it's got, you know, the major libraries. Let's got cats, it's got cats effect, it's got FS2. It's got all the stuff and you, you just don't have to fiddle with like importing all this great type level stuff, you know, one by one. You just give me the give me the thing. So that's really amazing. It's good for teaching, it's good for just getting started and, and seeing what's around. So yeah, we do have stack. There you go. You can go to typelevel.org. Um, so again, this is a, this is sort of a, a broad overview of how I sort of see type level and its ecosystem. And I want to I want to I'm sort of started an argument or you know a position really that um, you know why does this work? I think we have ample evidence that the way that the the ecosystem is designed works well. It's based on functional programming and a lot of theory. And, but in practice, it, it really does work. And I want to show you sort of why I think it does. And, um, and basically just kind of give some uh, perspectives and um, on that and, and, and sort of give you some, some takeaway points to like how to find more uh, people and projects uh, and how you can become involved and where you can learn more. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, so we have this ecosystem, and uh, here's our cool hex hexagonal logo. Uh, we haven't had the in-person conferences, so we haven't really had the opportunity to like give people the stickers. But you'll see people, uh, you know, you get lots of uh, stickers with the uh, hexagons, and you'll see people have them. Um, when we get together, we'll we'll make more of those because there's way more projects, so there's going to be way more stickers. Um, and so. We have, you know, what do we want to do as uh, as programmers, as engineers? Um, you know, it, in the end of the day, we're we're building these systems, and these systems involve things like databases, uh, talking to Kafka, you know, sort of data oriented um, services and and repositories. There's web services layered on top of that. We we talk JSON usually back and forth between things. We have gRPC, the you know all these things. We want to do testing. Uh, we want to model our particular domain, you know, like what's a valid request, what's an invalid request, uh, and, and so on. Um, and, you know, there's some more infrastructure kind of things. The, the glue layers, how do we configure things? How do we do logging? How do we tracing these days? You know, how do we send things to Honeycomb? Um, so this is what we want. And so if I was out there starting from scratch or evaluating a client's code base, I'd say, OK, well, what, uh, where do I go to get these capabilities? And uh, you know, I, this, is, this is what we want. But at the same time, you know, there are other options. There's, there's other kinds of styles of programming that are available within Scala. Scala can call you know, anything that's based on the JVM, so we can talk to Java code, which is a very different you know, API. Um, so uh, I would say in the type level community and, and in, in what folks have built, you know, composability is, is very important. And you know, that comes from our F, FP or functional programming background. And it has, it has real benefits. You know, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what those are. Um, we live in the modern programming world of uh, managed side effects, so we, we can uh, sort of deal with them as first side effects as, as uh, first class citizens, but in a safe way. We can have highly concurrent systems where we can talk about forking tasks and bringing them back together and do things, do these things serially, do these things um, uh, uh, concurrently, uh, and you know all sorts of programming patterns around concurrency. Uh, and maybe you know there's sort of a different model where we have streams of things going back and forth. So uh, a web server you might consider to be, you know, a stream of requests coming in and a stream of re uh, responses going out. Uh, and that can help sort of help you define and, and compose things together. Um, so 
I think the type level ecosystem does a great job of fulfilling these capabilities. Um, and it's really built on the libraries we've heard um, so, of so far today. And you're going to hear, I think every talk is going to be like, oh, well, this system is built on um, cats. And then on top of cats effect, it, on top of cats is cats effect. And on top of cats effect is FS2. And then maybe there's other layers going, you know, up and up. So, you know, here's our here's our type level stack, and stacks grow this way. They're like bricks. And when you build a building, uh, you use bricks because bricks don't, you know, are good at holding forces, compression forces. So you can just build them very high. Uh, so you you want a solid foundation, and and that's what we have here. So this is not, you know, the entire ecosystem, but this is definitely this this strong column that you can build all these other things out of. So um, sort of the, the base of this column is cats and cats effect and FS2. I'm going to talk about these. And then sort of uh, getting more into particular corners of technology, there's sort of HTTP 4S for Scala. You know, how do you build an HTTP server um, or, or a client to a server? And then sort of on the data access side, like uh, mentioned before in a previous talk, Skunk or or Doobie is another common one that, that we use. It's it's a it's a way to talk to a database. So you know you can imagine writing your uh, what you do at your at your job or what you do for fun out of these building blocks. So I'm going to give a brief uh, intro to to these and and how I kind of see them. Um, so we have cats and cats is really our our foundational layer, and um, you know, the, it's it uses the most fancy words. We have to use fancy words in functional programming. We have uh, functors and uh, applicatives and monads, and we can traverse. And it's really our utility belt of uh, functional programming. You know, we have these uh, common concepts. And we get to reuse them everywhere. So once they're defined in, in cats, all the layers above them can take advantage of uh, these abstractions. Um, so so this is what I this is what I usually tell people. Um, so you know you have a program you have a programming problem, and cats can help you solve it. And and it's a, it's the basic functional programming algorithm. Like how do I pro I have a problem? How do I solve it? Well, you first ask yourself, is it map? Can map solve my problem? Do I have a, a future of A and I need to turn it into a future of B? Okay, well, maybe not. Maybe it's not. Maybe map map is not the, my, the answer. Uh, well, then maybe maybe it's uh, maybe it's map n. This is the uh, the applicative. You know, I can combine more than one thing together and then call a function on that combined thing. And if it's not the applicative map n, then we'll okay. Then we'll bring out the monad. Can we flat map? Is flat map solve my problem? And if not, the answer is traverse. That's always the case, 100% of the time. 199% of the time is traverse. Uh, so that's the joke, uh, but it's really true. It's still true today. Um, so there you go. Uh, and you can always go to Imperial Pixels. Uh, AI powered robot to, to give it functional programming questions, and I encourage you to do so. It's a fun exercise. I'll, I'll have the link later uh, as yet another joke. So, what CATS really is, you know, uh, uh, it's a bunch of type classes that define common behaviors. So, you know, I mentioned the, the functor and the monad and the applicative, and there's more on top of that to say, okay, how can what does it generically mean to uh, be able to raise an error and handle an error? Or what does it mean to um, run something concurrently, you know, or in parallel, uh, you know, in scare quotes, uh, in an applicative way rather than sort of in the other way? And then also it's sort of this grab bag of really nice data types that you can use um, that fulfill particular niches. So there's errors versus warnings or non-empty collections. Very useful. You know, if you ever find yourself like throwing an exception when some input is a is a list because the list is empty, you can just avoid that altogether by these non-empty collections. So that's the base. So next up, most commonly used is a cat's effect. I was enamored of cat's effect, so I started writing the book. Check it out. Um, you know, here's our stack. We have 
Cat's Effect is built on top of Cat's, and Cat's Effect is about um, concurrency. And what does it mean to, uh, to we get the IO monad, so it's this, you know, it's this uber powerful monad that can do anything and it makes uh, these unsafe calls into Java code very safe or safer than before. So again, it's like cats. We have some data structures and we have some type classes and they sort of model these higher level um, behaviors. How do we do things? How do we sort of talk about concurrency at all in this world? Um, you know, lots of data types related to concurrency. So uh, we get um, resources really uh, important. So like, uh, you know, it's sort of a managed value. So for example, if you created the classic example would be like a file handle or a database uh, connection. Um, when someone uses it, you know, you instantiate it, you get access to that handle. And when somebody's done with it, you want them to close it. And everybody forgets to close them. And then you, you start to uh, develop some idioms around like tries and finallys. But in the functional programming world, we don't really do try and finally. So it sort of resource says, okay, you can use this value. And when you're, when, when you're done with it, I'll clean it up. So it's super handy. Um, and there's a, there's a whole slew of other things to do, all sorts of uh, concurrent programming. So as, a, as an extremely simple example, um, you know, I might define using cat's effects some, uh, some, some side effects here. I'm going to print to the console, hello, and then world. Um, and I can use cats. Um, this, is, this is sort of the beginning of, the, uh, of the, the, the leverage. You know, the leverage here is that um, I have these IOs as defined in cat's effect, but I can do things like tuple them together, which is, uh, on a, comes from map n and applicative in cats. And so uh, by building on these layers and these common abstractions, we can, we can model things like, okay, I want... I want to not just, uh, I have two effects, you know, defined separately, and I want to uh, turn them into, I want to convert them into a single effect. So, you know, more than, oops, I'm trying to unclick there. There we go. Uh, two effects become one effect. So I tuple them together and I get both their outputs, which I don't really care about at this point. Um, and when I execute that single effect, you know, I get one after the other. I get hello and then world. So there's a bit of composition there. We get composition from cats. Um, but then with the notion of this par map or par tupled, which is sort of an equivalent uh, form, we get those, we get parallel semantics. So when, when IO is par tupled, uh, I've defined a single effect, but its constituent parts, the hello and the world, are run concurrently. So we we we, we maintain the the uh, the model there. So you know when we actually execute the single effect, we get you know hello world or world hello, depending on which one runs first, because they're run concurrently. So this pattern repeats itself over and over again. Cats is using the 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 concepts encoded as the type classes. Cat's effect, sorry, is using the type classes of cats to encode these semantics of uh, serialized or concurrent execution. And then you get all these things. And then moving up in our stack, we have cats and then cats effect. Cats effect gives you some concurrent programming. Well, what if we wanted to do uh, the notion of streams? And, uh, what is a concurrent? effectful streaming system look like. Um, and if you talk to folks uh, who've built things with FS2, you know, you can view FS2 as just like this DSL on top of cat's effect that allows you to express control flow and other concurrency patterns, not in such low level terms as queues and semaphores and locks and all these things that maybe cat's effect uh, uh, that cat's effect models, but in FS2, you just sort of uh, glue these um, streams together and uh, it sort of fits our, fits our mental model better. And again, it's just building on top of these things. Um, then 
uh, you know, on top of FS2, you can then start to model HTTP servers and clients. So, you know, if, if we're doing streaming, uh, I sort of mentioned it before, you know, what is a HTTP server? Well, you can consider it as something that handles streams of requests coming in and produces a stream of responses going out, you know, driven by some external loop. Um, so, so HTTP for S provides sort of this DSL on top of streaming and uh, streaming concepts and uh, concurrency concepts to provide a nice interface where you define routes and the routes take a single request and produce a single response. And that gets folded together into something that's extreme, that basically is lifted single request response pairs into streams of incoming and streams of outgoing. And it, it just keeps working and there's layers on top of that, et cetera. Skunk is a database library. Uh, it talks to Postgres. And again, that's uh, a streaming model and a concurrency model fit very uh, fit very well in, into what it is to access data from a, from a database. So you're, you do, in Skunk um, and libraries like uh, and Doobie, you define queries and then you sort of hand them off to these sessions or connection objects and that's what actually executes it and it produces uh, an IO value and maybe you have you know you, you have a query a query might produce a stream of results that you have to pull uh, you know you maybe you just want the first result of this you know unknown amount of, of uh, results or maybe you want to uh, you know you want to do limit 100 so you first fe first fetch uh, you, you you just pull the, the first 100 from that stream. And, and so all these fit together. I'm repeating myself. And again, all these foundations build on each other. So we might have um, some separate queries. I just stole these really quickly. And we might want to run two queries, uh, one after the other. We do the simple one first, and we do the extended one second. And we're just using regular flat maps, monads, um, sequential composition. But maybe we want to tuple them together or par tuple them to run them in parallel. And we can use the same combinators that, that are defined in cats and all the way up to cats effect. Maybe you want to fork some things and manage them uh, manually. Uh, we can compose them in all the same ways that we could before. So that's like the stack. That's a very super quick um, uh, overview of like the core. Everyone's gonna everyone's gonna use this core over and over again, which is the, the which is the whole point. Uh, so to kind of finish, um, I'm trying to go quickly because there's just so much. Um, I kind of want to talk about why I think all of this works. Um, I think we have proof, you know, empirically we can say that the type level stack, it works. People people will tell you, yeah, okay, it was pretty easy to just get going and, and build these layers on top of the layers that we already have. Um, why does that work? Um, and I, I guess I was inspired by this quote. Um, I think I have the book. It's right here. It's right here. I have it. Assistance Bible. You might as well look at the book. Here it is. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's by John Gall, and uh, it says that, uh, well, if you have a complex system that works, you know, if something's working but it's very complex, it, it, it must have come from a simple system uh, that worked. You, you can't just make a complex system that's designed from scratch. It just doesn't work because you're trying to, uh, there's no evolution going on. There's no, uh, it, it's just too hard to fit all the pieces together. Uh, if you're trying to do something complex, you have to start from the simple. Um, and so to me, this maps very well with like uh, how, how our ecosystem began. You know, there, there's always been complex web servers. There's always, you know, web server software. There's always been database access layers. Um, but I think until the foundations from libraries like CATS came around, um, it was a lot more ad hoc. Um, and so once we had those solid foundations, we could, we could start relying on them in, in, to build these complex systems. That's sort of my argument. 
Um, and kind of the, another way to look at it would be like, uh, you know, you're using some complex framework, like, oh, what's, what, what are the latest ones? Like, uh, well, juice is, juice is like really old, but juice is like a dependency injection framework. And there's, uh, I've, I've taken frameworks out of my brain because I, I avoid them. But like, uh, one of the jokes is, you know, what is a framework? It's, it's a product with all the business logic removed, but all the assumptions are left in. So, you know, when you, when you, when you use a framework, you have to play by their rules. And sometimes those rules are, are, are not stated up front. And it comes out in, in weird ways. You try and use the framework and something doesn't quite fit. You have to do some trickery to get it to do what you want it to do. And I think that's because, you know, well, it's because there's these assumptions that you can't see. And so I think one of the benefits that functional programming gives, especially with the static types and as represented by cats and cats effect and FS2 and these layers is the assumptions are very clear. The assumptions are, are actually encoded as like type class constraints. This must be a monad or this must have the uh, monad error type class available that says, I know how to handle errors. You don't need to worry about me. Um, I think that's why, why what we have works well. Uh, I'm going to go skip over that. So, I think I think there's been a long there's been a long argument that libraries are greater than frameworks, and part of that is just there's less assumptions and there's more. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to fulfill as many constraints, or those constraints themselves are not uh, in a library. Those constraints can be more directly encoded. Um, so. If you're evaluating some libraries or a framework, you want to say, well, what what are the least assumptions I need to make? What do I need to know, and and how do I reduce that? Because that that's actually that's a cost on us as developers. So um, this is what I want, or maybe there's can be no assumptions. Like I don't have to assume anything. Everything that I need to provide to the library, the library tells me exactly what I need to do. There's nothing, nothing hidden at all. I think that's the case in, in our world. Um, what are the sources of friction? Uh, this is sort of my checklist that, that I go through if I'm uh, you know, evaluating something. Uh, and so how would you evaluate type level? I think things work really well because they they're, have a lot of shared um, values and uh, technology. Um, and, you know, if you, I think we have found, I think everyone has many stories of, oh, well, we integrated this library, but it just, when we did that, all these problems just popped up and popped up. So instead of just having a fixed cost or, you know, maybe a linear cost, the cost just went up and up and up. So th that's the thing that we want to avoid. Um, so, Along that line, you know, I, I would sort of claim that the the type level libraries have only these only additive costs, not sort of multiplicative or even exponential costs. So concretely, you know, once you sort of know and understand cats uh, and integrate with it, then to go from cats to cats effect uh, is much simpler than if you were just given some random concurrency library um, because there's not this like fan out of concepts. The concepts sort of stay linearly bounded. Um, and I'd love to talk about why I think this is true sort of philosophically, mathematically. I think it has to do with the cool words like parametricity and closure, um, but those are good side conversations that we can have. Um, so how do you learn more about type level? Uh, you're here, you're at the type, this, uh, you know, the summit. So this is, a, this is a great place to learn about the latest and greatest. Um, but if you want to step back, you know, just, it's always good to, to say, okay, here's where you start. Um, there's the website, there's lots of pro per project sites, there's blog posts. If you, you know, if you type, you know, if you do the Google test, you know, type level database library and you hit enter, then you'll get an answer. 
Um, there are books out there. There are people who can help you do trainings and mentoring. Uh, something that I do, something other folks do. Um, so, you know, you can get particular um, directed information about this stuff. Uh, here's our cool books. Uh, there is the community. We have the conference. We have uh, Discord. Uh, we have GitHub. We have mailing lists. We have all the good stuff. Uh, and we have the people. We have our steering committee, which sort of helps us go where we want to go. You can hire people who know about these libraries. You can hire the authors of these libraries, as, as we've heard. Uh, you know, who best to, uh, to help you learn about and perhaps extend some of these uh, libraries and technologies. There's lots of tooling. So there's all these SBT plugins, which make life easier. Uh, there's now the toolkit. So you can sort of get that bundle and try it out. Um, more and more maturity and uh, brand recognition, I would say. Um, there we go. There's Scala Steward. So here's the robot that updates your code. In 2021, it did a, it had done a total of uh, 147,000 PRs. You don't have to do these up library upgrades anymore. And you know today, it's like double that, more than double that. So Scala Steward just shows us how much people use our, our, our work and uh, how many people just want the automatic updates. So it's fantastic. It's a, it's a great project. I always am happy when I see those uh, PRs come in. So to finish up, um, we have this stack. We have this hard work that's been solidified and built over the years. And it uses these common techniques that we know about. So when we come across a type level project, we can say, oh, well, I bet it's built on cats. And it's, if it, there's concurrency going on, it's going to be built on cats effect. And how do those systems work? Well, they define type classes that sort of declare what the behaviors are, and they have some extra data structures. So you can say, oh, it's a type class based system. I know this. Um, the integration cost for random type level library is going to be much lower once you know the one or two things that it rests on, rather than it being completely specialized and you have to learn a whole new voc vocabulary your vocabulary gets reused and your brain gets reused and you can just concentrate on what you need to do. So that is why type level is working and wonderful. Um, these things are composable. They're, there's a closed system. We're not multiplying the number of concepts you need to know. And we're doing the wonderful world work of uh, not performing side effects until later. Um, and even if you are working in the world of side effects, we can, we can deal with that too. Um, and at the same time, you can concentrate on your domain. I'm modeling uh, online e-commerce stuff, and I can use type level. And those concepts don't need to mix very much. I have concurrency, and that has nothing to do with my domain. And the type level world is not reaching in. Uh, they're nicely orthogonal. Uh, so thank you to the community. Thanks for having me. I hope I hope this was a good uh, review of what people have built and what and you know I'm I'm happy to use these things every day. Uh, there's lots of people out there. I think the people are wonderful. I, I I don't mention it enough, but you know you can go online and someone will give you an answer, and they're very nice. So uh, if it's not the author, it's somebody who works on this stuff all the time. So get out there and talk to people. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Adam. That was great. Lovely overview. Uh, and uh, folks who had fun with this, be sure to come back tomorrow where Adam will be talking about I don't know driven design. Yeah.